Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to today's seminar. So, today's speaker is Ube Tila from Munster, and Ube has done lots of nice work on nonlinear dynamics of complex fluids, uh, soft matter, and active matter. And today is going to tell us about anti diffusion in non reciprocal conduct. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. So, so I put obviously I put anti diffusion in title because the program has anti diffusion, and uh, I will explain to you in, in, in the course of the talk um, why I think all these decomposition systems are very typical examples of anti diffusion. But I learned last week in the workshop that uh, I mean we work on with most of the people work on so different scales because if I say something is mesoscopic. I refer to length scales between 10 and 100 nanometers, while last week these were totally different length scales. So, so that's why I thought before I start to talk about the subject, I should maybe first mention the fields we, we are working in in the group in, in Münster. And these are, so I would say, it's all sort of interface dominated soft matter systems. And um, there are two big fields. One is sort of relaxation and structuring. So if I have, for instance, a thin liquid film um, and the divets a substrate and then the droplets are coarsening and so on. So this would be a typical example of anti-diffusion because the, meta the material just tries to get together, right, and form droplets. And then we also work in colloidal crystallization and uh, we are very interested in relating like phase transitions and bifurcation diagrams um, so I like bifurcation diagrams, you will see uh, a few of them. And then over the past years, we have also started to sort of introduce activity, that means non-equilibrium driving in, let's say, a controlled way into this uh, active uh, soft matter models. And that's the part where I will talk about, I will talk about bifurcations, phase transitions in some active media models, um, in particular talk about this, um, this non-reciprocal here. Okay, and the methods we, we use are often continuum models, so these so-called thin film equations or uh, equations for, for mix for, for concentrations. But I've also collaborated with many people on that work on various other scales, so starting from molecular dynamics, kinetic Monte Carlo uh, simulations or um, dynamic density function theory, and also on the larger scales when talking about Navier-Stokes or phase field. But you see, my larger scales are, are still your, your very small scales when, when we talk about the climate models. OK, so what do I want to do today? So I want first uh, to discuss what is non-reciprocity. So it's a, a bit of a hype, I think, the last year. So it's a word one can use, or one can also just say it's a certain type of non-equilibrium driving in the systems. And then I will talk about the way we model um, this dynamics, so I introduce what I call a gradient dynamics, what I call also passive models, and then we introduce activity, and I will uh, distinguish three types of non-reciprocity to sort of sort a little bit what we, we did in the literature. And then I come to the, to the Kahn-Hilliard model and talk about some um, of the typical states and solutions. And finally, I ask, let's say, the question whether this is just some other made up model or whether it has some, some deeper meaning um, like in, in a hierarchy of equations. Okay, this is a good place here to talk about Newton's third law and actually how to break it. And so if you go back into original literature, you find either the, the Latin version or the English version of his uh, third law. And this is actually a, a screenshot uh, from the second, from his preparation from for the second edition. So when he went from the first to the second edition, he wanted to cross out the first sentence because it was essentially redundant. All right, so let me read to you the English version of the first edition. So to every action, there's always a post and equal reaction, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal, and directed to contrary parts. And then if you go to, to Google and you do an image search, then you find this typical examples where some of them are actually really expressing this, and some others are actually very doubtful if you read the, the examples. But the typ typical one would be like the, the air balloon, for instance, um, where you have the equal action towards the back than to the front. 
Okay, so how are we allowed to break it? And so people now set up a lot of models where they, they, they call them non-reciprocal, uh, non-reciprocity breaking Newton's third law. And so in general, we do not break the laws, right? But we use a description that ignores certain parts of what's going on. And then at the end, you come to, to let's say, effective models that look like you have breaking broken Newton's law, right? So I would say active particles, objects, media, draw on some energy source and motivation, maybe uh, that are invisible to the coarse grained model, right? And then we have, have broken. So this I would like to clarify at the beginning. So typical examples would be uh, predator-prey um, interactions. Here you have uh, a flock of sheep, and there's a dog or a wolf at, or a shepherd at the center, and so there is some, some uh, mutual interaction where the sheep wants to avoid the predator. And if you model this, like here in a, from a paper of Chen and Kolokolnikov, uh, if you model this, for instance, with a discrete model, just setting up point particles that have interactions that are non-reciprocal, you can find, depending on the strengths of your non-reciprocity, you can find just steady structures where there is sort of a, this ring of, of the sheep around the predator. And then if you crank this up, you get actually self-excited motion. You get sort of waves in this ring, and you get then quite um, chaotic, let's say, waves along the interface between sheep and no sheep. Right? So this would be a typical example where you find this. And then the other examples, um, there are actually not many physical examples where really people see this in, let's say, particle systems. So there's one, it's a rather complicated system. It's well described in this, this paper by Hartmut Löwen and, and collaborators uh, from 2015, where you have, let's say, particles that sit in a plasma chamber, and there are two types of particles here, like of layered, and because there's plasma around, they have non-reciprocal interactions because they have wakes somehow, right? It's, but it's very complicated, and then um, you can look at this paper. And then what, what there are many examples of uh, theoretical microscopic models here from the groups of Tadjou and Golestanian, a very similar, uh, very similar model for bacterial populations of different types of bacteria that interact through some um, quorum sensing, right? So, and what one sees here already, you see um, in these microscopic simulations that you have areas of different concentrations of the different here red and blue type bacteria, and there's a lot of dynamics going on, and there seems to be decomposition, for instance, here between the background and, um, let's say, a higher concentration region, there are traveling bands, and so on. Right? So, and people also now start from, from this microscopic model, do coarse craning to come to continuum models. Okay, if you try to sort of set up what types of models you find in the literature and how they are, they are related, I mean, there's a huge, a huge number of them, and I would distinguish on the one hand sort of microscopic models that are discrete, stochastic, and then macroscopic ones, they are continuum. Right? And you would hear on the left end, you could have atomistic molecular dynamic simulations, but here on the right hand end of, let's say, where also you do some coarsening, some putting things together, effective uh, agent uh, models, you would have traffic flow models, right? Where you describe the individual car, you do not do uh, atomistic MD for the car, right? And then you do some coarse training procedures and you come somewhere from some of those models, you go down to some of those macroscopic models. And then within the macroscopic models, you can again do approximations, coarse craning, doing amplitude equations, and so on. And um, so now, nowadays, um, if you go somewhere here, so you have direct quantitative relation. Nowadays, people call this a predictive field theory. And then you could also come from the macroscopic scale and just say, OK, I take conservation law symmetries to standard non equilibrium thermodynamics, and I essentially postulate based on these this basic properties models coming from, from the other side. Right? And what I will show you is somewhere in the middle. So I will not talk about course creating how to get. OK, let's first talk about continuum models. All of them that I talk about are over them, so there's no inertia. Right? And uh, the passive case is the case where I want to define gradient dynamics. And 
I put here a footnote, so people call this a thermodynamic case, reciprocal case, variational case. Nowadays, often, uh, they try to relate also to quantum mechanics and call it the, the Hermitian case. Okay, now, if someone tells me, I have here a system, uh, there is some scalar or the parameter field, let's say, concentration, a density, could you just give me a model that describes how this goes to equilibrium? Okay, if you give me an energy, then we just set up an equation dynamics. We say I have a free energy, for instance, F of my field phi, and then uh, this dynamics with a negative sign here and the positive definite mobility will just go to equilibrium, right? So that's the simplest, uh, steepest gradient dynamics get, that you can set up. But then the person says, no, I, but I have a system where my order parameter field is conserved, right? So the integral is conserved, so this is not working with your equation here. Then I say, okay, then let's go to the next uh, complicated one. We need the conservation law, and then we write the flux as a mobility, again, positive definite, times the gradient now of this variation that is, a, let's say, a pressure or chemical potential, for instance. Right? So I would call this a kind of type model. And then the person said, okay, but that's nice, but I have many fields. I have 10 coupled concentrations somehow interacting. Some of them can actually leave the system. There's some evaporation. So I have a mixture of conserved and non-conserved dynamics. I say, okay, easy enough. We just combine this type of equations. Now we have, let's say we have N fields, so we combine n of those equations where now each of them has um, a non-conserved and the conserved part in the dynamics. And then each of the fields can be driven by all the chemical potential gradients uh, or the pressure gradients that come from all the different fields. However, I have to be careful these mobility matrices here. They now have to be positive, definite, and symmetric, right? To have a nice system that goes to equilibrium. Right. So this would be um, correspond to Onsaga reciprocal reciprocity relations and microscopic reversibility, these two properties. Okay, typical example. So that's from um, a simulation uh, that, that we did right now for a two-layer liquid film that de-wets. So you have first have the evolution of some droplets by de-wetting, and now you get some coarsening in the long time scale will stop at some point. So that would be a typical, let's say, you could call it the aggregation process. And it describes more or less all the, the, the level of numerics that nowadays we can do on the personal computer, right, without going on, on big computers. But still a rather long uh, simulation, uh, because for these thin film models, these mobilities are very nasty. They are power laws, uh, H to the Q. So, so this is simpler for things like uh, Panhayat models. Okay, just as a side remark, in case someone wants to talk to me about this the, the, the next weeks, you can incorporate into this, um, into this gradient dynamics formalism, you can incorporate chemical reactions. So that's possible. If you go back to the literature, actually 100 years, Marcel Langmore, the Donda, and this has recently become quite prominent in uh, biophysics, where people try to model um, Bio, uh, cellular aggregates, uh, no, how do you call them? Um, this membrane less organelles in the cell that uh, come from decomposition and with chemical reactions. So then actually you have to add a non-conserved term that has a slightly different structure. So it has all the stoichiometric um, coefficients in from, let's say, a number of, of chemical reactions. And then these fluxes go beyond um, these rates go beyond the linear non equilibrium thermodynamics. You have to go to non linear uh, non equilibrium thermodynamics because then you, um, if you have a mass action kinetics with detailed balance in this complicated form with the exponentials, you get then exactly you can prove that your energy goes down and you start with a y direction, but at the end you go to, to equilibrium, right? And then you can actually start from this and then break this in a controlled way. And we recently did this for synth film models. OK. We want to talk about decomposition type models. So I should um, tell you what is a Kahn-Hilliard model. So it's a model where phi is now a concentration. And we, can, we want to model, let's say, decomposition of a binary mixture or higher order mixture. 
and then uh, you can come from a microscopic model and you can derive, let's say, a free energy. A free energy would look like this. So you have logarithmic terms that are the entropic terms. You have interaction terms between uh, the, two, the two type of uh, material. And you have some penalization terms that penalize interfaces. Otherwise, you would blow up an interface. So these are the interface energies, so gradient square terms. And defining your field as phi 1, then phi 2 is 1 minus phi. And uh, then with this type of mobility function, you get, OK, and approximating this expression by a power law, you get the classical Cantillard equation where you combine this dynamics with a double well potential, what is also sometimes called the phi to the 4 theory. Um, and then plugging this in, taking the variation, plugging it in, you come to the standard form of the Cartier equation, where you have, it's a fourth order equation. It has a cubic uh, nonlinearity here. And then this um, Laplace um, term is the, 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 interface, the, the interface term, right? And I will call this term just F dash. Okay, and this type of passive systems uh, for, I mean, this other main part of what we do in the group is, is the synfill models. And this is just an overview of what, what we can now do in, in the synfill models. Also, just in case someone wants to talk to me about synfill models, uh, the, the past years who has, who has seen this type of talks of mine before, I would point out that the past years we are now able to do droplets on polymer brushes we are able to include um, evaporation. That means we can go um, now with a thin film or long wave model from the full spectrum from uh, diffusion limited evaporation to phase transition limited evaporation, what was not possible before. Okay, now let's break this nice gradient dynamic structure. Right? And this I call the active case. People call it trivial, permanently out of equilibrium, non-reciprocal, non-variational, non-Hermitian as well, recently. And now looking through the literature, I, I try to sort the different types of non-reciprocity. Right? So this term is chemical potential or pressure, and this comes from the free energy. So there are the interaction energies of the different components. So if you break this structure, here in, in this sort of chemical potential, by adding a chemical potential in the conserved part or the non-conserved part or both, that cannot be obtained as a variation of a free energy function, right? Then this uh, breaks Newton's third law, right? So this would be uh, what people call breaking Newton. However, you can also break the Onsaga structure of the mobility matrices, right? If you take an um, non-symmetric or not positive definite uh, mobility matrix, then you break on Zara. I would say that, that I would call thermodynamic non-reciprocity. Right? This you could call mechanical non-reciprocity. However, you can all also mess around with the reaction term um, by, for instance, coupling the system to an external chemostat that consistently feeds material in and takes material out. And then I said, then we call this breaking the donda, and this would be a chemical non-reciprocity, right? And what I will point out briefly later on, that for some systems, for some models, you can actually transform the first type of non-reciprocity in the second type. And um, so orders get slightly diffused between the different, between the categories. Yeah. So there's nothing stochastic in any of these equations. Yet if you had a noise to vary Given by Q and so on and so forth. Are you going to say anything about it or is it going to be any different? No, I'm fully deterministic. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussion how to add noise on top of the continuum equation. I mean, but I, have, I think you have to be very, very careful because you get the continuum equations by averaging over all the noise. You have the entropic terms. And so, so I prefer not to do it. Let's say. Okay, now examples where you have, let's say, for two field gradient dynamics where um, people look at, at these broken gradient dynamics models. So if there's no field conserved, then every 
uh, two field reaction diffusion system that does anything interesting is a broken gradient dynamics, right? So that's studied for half a century or, or uh, even nearly a century. Right? Complex Ginsburg Landau equation or two field biofilm models would be two big examples. If one field is conserved, then you could look at two field reaction diffusion systems with one conservation law, another subject that is uh, quite fashionable over the, the past years um, to see what is actually the effect of conservation laws for reaction diffusion systems, and there, there are some interesting results in the literature. Synfil models for reactive wetting, active phase free crystal models. Um, so the olive ones are all systems we have worked on at some point. Uh, here I'm cheating because it's not two scalar fields, one of them is a pseudo scalar. Actually, then models for chemotaxis and tumor growth you can find in the literature. And if you go to two fields that are conserved, then actually if you take two layers of liquid, like the one that I showed you in the, in the simulation, and you heat it from, from below, then actually um, you, you have also non-reciprocal coupling effectively by, by the temperature process. Then um, what I will talk about, non-reciprocally coupled Canadian models, but you can also take the phase field crystal models. <laughs> okay, that was a very lengthy introduction sort of to, to set the field what I want to talk about. And now I will come back at the very end to this structure that I show here at the center that is very interesting. And uh, this work on the non-reciprocal um, Kahn-Hayard model is work with, with Tobias and, and Daniel and a few contribution also by, um, um, I forgot his name for the moment, <laughs> small contribution. Um, Okay, um, Giorgio Liovato, now I have it, sorry. Sorry, Giorgio, if you watch this movie. I, um, so coupled um, can hear the equations with non-reciprocal interactions. So let's go slowly through the equations. So we have now two fields, phi one and phi two, and we have, let's say, the standard passive part that is everything with the exception of this red alpha here. Right, so you have for each of the two fields, you have a local free energy, F1 and F2, here the first derivatives enter, and then you have, um, here we all, I only have linear interactions, so you have rho with the same sign, here phi2 enters here phi1, so this would be an attractive interaction if rho is, we think, negative and um, repulsive if rho is positive. No, the other way around, because it enters with a minus. Okay. And then we break the structure by adding uh, a non-reciprocal linear interaction. Right? So we have here plus alpha and here minus alpha, so you can, the terms in red, you cannot obtain from a, from a free energy function. And then the Fs, we, we have some parameters in that, that uh, do not matter at the moment. Right? Very important is, the parameter kappa, what is the ratio of rigidities, you could say the ratio of interface energies uh, if you have a decomposed state. Um, this is the energy for everything that gives you everything as a gradient dynamics with the exception of the, the red terms. And yeah, so I call this the coupling strength or activity in the following. And uh, if you want to put now this model in my general scheme of sorting these equations, these models, then it would be the case of a non-equilibrium chemical potential. That means we break Newton's law, right? And this model was, let's say, um, studied quite widely uh, in the early 2020s. So essentially by us, by the group of, of Amin Golistanian and the group of Christina Marchetti. This was all published 2020, 21, the first works. And then there were quite a number more later on. Okay, now, how do we analyze this type of models? Normally we would start with uh, homogeneous states. These are two conservation laws, so any homogeneous state is a solution of the, of the system. Then we look at linear stability, and then we start to look into bifurcations and, and non-equilibrium states. Okay, now if you ignore the outer Laplacian for a moment, what is actually written there is just the two-component reaction diffusion system, right? And then we can go back to Turing 
and look at the linear stability analysis, get Hopf bifurcations, Turing, uh, help Hopf instabilities, Turing instabilities, so short wave stationary instability, and we can also get what I call the Karl Hilliard instability, what is a long wave uh, stationary uh, instability. Now, if you we now put the Laplace back in, in the linear stability analysis, it just gives us a wave number square. Right? That means, and this implies that all the stability borders of the instabilities I just mentioned, they are still valid. So we can just take over everything that was done for reaction diffusion systems and apply it there. The, the dispersion relations, so the dependency of growth rate um, and, and frequency on wave number changes, right? Because there's a de facto k squared, but not the thresholds of instability, right? And that means, so that's what I've written here. So that implies several things. So now writing the linear stability problem, like a matrix problem, like k square coming from the blah, blah, Laplacian times a matrix B, then B corresponds to the Turing case and we can then, if we take on the axis, let's say, the second derivatives of this local um, energy terms at fixed mixed derivative, we can get this type of diagrams where we have now uh, different instability borders when coming from stable. We can cross this border, then we have a long wave um, stationary instability, the Kahn-Heard instability. We can cross this part, we have an oscillatory long wave instability, Hopf, or we cross this short orange border here, so we have a touring instability, right? And from looking at the can case in the, in the passive case, so that means when non-reciprocity, that was alpha, and recipro reciprocal coupling was delta, when this expression is smaller zero, then we have just a boring uh, stability plane like for, like for can -Hilliard. And if we flip this, so if alpha is larger than the absolute value of alpha is larger than the absolute value of delta, then we get this type of, of um, diagram. So the side remark, um, this parallel uh, to the Turing case implies that kappa actually takes the role of the ratio of the diffusion constants in the Turing place. So the inter interface rigidities uh, play the role of the diffusion constant in the Turing case. That means if you pick the ratio to be one, then you lose all the Turing instability, right? So you need to pick a kappa not equal one to get this short, um, small scale stationary instability. Okay, now I show you some example of states without going too much um, into detail there. So for instance, this would be uh, a typical dispersion relation. So here, the real part of um, the eigenvalue over the wave number. This is sort of one mode and the other one is stable. Both have to go to zero as two, both, both fields are conserved. And so this is, looks like the standard um, can hear mode. However, if you run a time simulation here as a space-time plot, um, then at the beginning, you will get the mode closest to the maximum. So here you have three periods. Then you get some coarsening. So in Kahn-Hilliard, you would coarsen up to system size. Right? So you would get to the largest possible mode. However, here already nonlinearity kicks in. And um, this is an effect of the non-reciprocity. You actually arrest the coarsening after a few steps. Right? So you get a, a finite wavelength pattern. So in this case, for n equals 2. And uh, so we call this a nonlinear suppression of, of coarsening. However, you can also get um, a linear suppression because if you cross this other instability border that was uh, the orange one, then you get this type of um, dispersion relations, right? So you have a finite uh, band of unstable wave numbers about the critical one. However, it's slightly different from the classical Turing instability because the center of the band will actually move with parameters, right? And uh, remember, it goes back here to k equals zero. So if you do weekly nonlinear theory, you have to incorporate not only the contribution from the, um, 
from the critical wave number, but also from the zero mode, right? As um, Matthew and Cox did in, in, I think in 2000. Okay, and here what happens here, we, we get um, already, I mean, here we, we try to cheat the system by, by starting with a, with a n equals one, so system, system size mode, but it knows that it should actually not, that this mode is actually not, not unstable and it will sort of undergo a, a single reverse coarsening step to get to the n equals two mode. So it says that I have talked half an hour. Um, that's more or less fine. And then, if you have this type of instability, then um, you know then all the work by, by Edgar, for instance, of, on, on snaking, of, uh, on, on homoclinic snaking, then you actually can get the full snaking picture of, of a localized state. Right? So you can, for instance, get this type of bifurcation diagrams where you plot uh, one of the mean concentrations on the x-axis and then here some solution measure, some norm, and you get the typical picture of homogeneous state, then chaotic state, and then you get this snaking of localized state where you have finite sized pattern that coexists with the uniform background, right? And this is a slanted snaking case because you have this conservation loss. However, as we have broken non reciprocity, uh, as we have broken reciprocity, we can now also get all sorts of um, oscillatory states, right? And what we here I show you, where we have not yet the case of the Hopf instability, it's still the case of a um, of the Kahn-Hilliard or Turing instability. I'm not quite sure which one this is. And then, as secondary instabilities, you get here uh, drift pit fog bifurcations, Hopf bifurcations, and you find then different branches of traveling waves, standing waves, modulated waves, right? You get everything that you, you can imagine from a, also from a range of views. Okay, now these were some examples. Now I mentioned at the beginning that we can uh, transform the non-reciprocity that we have here by this plus alpha and minus alpha, that we can actually uh, get this into the mobilities. So, do I show actually the transformation? No, I don't show the transformation, but you, you, it's a simple transformation where you essentially absorb different factors into a new F, F1 tilde and F2 tilde and uh, compensate by similar factors in the mobilities. However, then what you get looks like a, it looks like a gradient dynamics. Right? It has the form of a gradient dynamics. However, it's not, right? Because your energy is not a proper thermodynamic energy. It's not bounded from below anymore. And your mobilities are not proper thermodynamic mobilities because they're now not anymore uh, positive definite. They can be indefinite, right? However, it means you have an energy. So you can try what happens if you do a Maxwell construction, right? If you say, I have phase coexistence between different phase. I get the coexisting phase by doing a standard Maxwell construction, right? However, one has to be careful how one interprets then what interpretation one gives because it's a, what you get is a spurious pressure, it's spurious chemical potentials, spurious phase diagrams, but you can get all of this, right? And let's see what, what this means. So I give you just one example. So this would then be a phase diagram that you can obtain. Sorry, I changed variables from phi to u. So u1, u2, var are the mean values. And then you get the spinodals where decomposition sets in. You get the binodals. And these are now binodals that you get from this spurious Maxwell construction. Right? And I also draw here the, um, the border of the Hopf instability. And what you see here, if you go, for instance, to this tie line that connects two coexisting states, that one of them is stable and the other one is not stable because um, it is inside the Hopf region, right? And then we, we, took as a, we took this as a hypothesis and said, let's see, maybe this gives us a coexistence between a uniform state and an oscillatory state. And indeed, these are now one-dimensional space-time simulations, uh, space-time plots for one-dimensional simulations. So this is time, this is space, 
and these are different positions along this tie line. And what you see here is that you get first a nice separation of two different mean concentrations, but then also on this, this um, high concentration part, you get different types of, um, of traveling and standing waves. Right? And if you look at a, a cross section somewhere here, you see that the, the wave, wavy part is very well centered about the, the prediction that comes from the Maxwell construction. Okay, you could now do the same for actually these crystalline phases where that come out of the, um, of the touring instability and also there you can actually include um, this in, in the phase diagram, you get the coexistence between the uniform state and the crystalline state. So all these are sort of, I think, interesting results because they, they imply that there's maybe a, a, a third type of, of models, right? You can have the passive models, you can have the fully active models, and there is a class of models where you can do this transformation that I, I sort of only sketched, and where you then can use uh, all the tools of um, equilibrium thermodynamics to get certain predictions, but you, you should then check them with time simulations whether they actually um, uh, are true or are correct. And then what is not yet sufficiently discussed is when, uh, uh, let's say, when do your predictions not work anymore, right? So we are, we are working on this. Okay, now I started directly with this non-reciprocal Kanhean model. Right? And people just made them up essentially in the 2020-21. But now the question arises, is this just a made up model or is this in some way more important? Um, and so to come to this point, I need to stretch your patience a little bit, I think, because first I pro propose to you to amend the classical cross hohenberg classification of linear instabilities for, um, for homogeneous isotropic systems. Right, so I don't know how many have seen of you have seen this. There is this classification in 1s, 1, 0, 2, and 3. I tell you in a second what they are. These are six uh, linear instabilities discussed in this huge 1993 review paper uh, at the beginning. And what we propose is to amend or expand this classification based on three properties of the instability. Saying, okay, we have either a large scale or a small scale instability, so finite wave number or zero wave number, that's like here. Then we have either stationary or oscillatory, so having an imaginary part in the eigenvalue or not. However, what turns out to be very important is whether you have a conservation law or you have no conservation law in the system. And then taking these three properties, we come actually then to eight different linear instabilities. And uh, I have put them here at the table. So we have homogeneous or large scale stationary that um, would be for non conserved, would be the Allen Kahn for conserved, the Kahn Hegart instability. And this was in, um, in the parentheses, you have always what um, the, the Cross Holmberg classification would call it. However, then also the small scale, you have stationary and oscillatory, and also for the large scale, you have also the oscillatory, right? And these two here at the end, they, they have no counterpart in the, in the cross holmberg classification. Okay, this is just preliminary, because now if we plot dispersion relation for the eight different cases, we can, uh, each of the four cases here covers um, at the same time the stationary and the oscillatory instability, because I show only the real part. And then we look through the literature and try to find the amplitude equation, so the weakly nonlinear theory for these eight instabilities. What we find for the stationary case, we find the Allen Kahn, the Kahn Heert equation as derived in the past five years by, by Walter Zimmermann for systems with a single conservation law that undergo a long wave instability. Then the real Ginsburg Landau and um, the real Ginsburg Landau and nonlinear diffusion equation. That is the case with mass conservation, right? Also here with mass conservation. However, if we go to the oscillatory case, we find complex Ginsburg Landau for Hopf. We find coupled complex Ginsburg Landaus and coupled complex Ginsburg Landaus and nonlinear diffusion for short wave parts. However, I couldn't spot this one, right? 
okay, then we had to go, we tried to derive it. And what we did, we said, okay, now this is our dispersion relation <clears throat> at onset, the middle one, and then above onset, this one. These are the imaginary parts, and then we put all the epsilons in and came up with an ansatz that had, let's say, uh, that essentially just followed the modes at onset. So there was nothing in it like a typical frequency or typical spatial periodicity, right? What at the end one could say it's some sort of a Taylor expansion. However, if you do this, and we started with a um, erection diffusion model with arbitrary many, let's say, n, um, n fields, and two of them were conserved, so two conservation laws. And it had this oscillatory long wave instability. Then we came up with an equation that looks awful, but it has exactly the structure of a non reciprocal Carnot model. It has the mobilities here in the flux, so here's our the derivative. Then there's the next derivative, and then these are just cubic polynomials up to here, and then we have the high order uh, derivatives, the fourth, four, fourth order derivatives, where also the cross terms are uh, included. Right? Okay, we thought that's nice, but um, we were also sort of worried because it was not yet the real amplitude equation that we were looking for because if you analyze this equation, you do not only get the instability we, we wanted, you get also all the other instabilities again back, right? So what we actually figured is that this is not the amplitude equation that we looked for, but it's some sort of a higher order amplitude equation if you go up in the hierarchy and, and you expand about a, a co-dimension three or four point where all these instabilities fall together, right? However, it should now be used to, to go to, um, to, to get, let's say, universal equations still for all sorts of different systems, starting from heated two-layer systems, but also oscillatory coupled um, lipid and protein dynamics in cell membranes. There are models with two conservation laws and oscillatory dynamics. And then this uh, fashionable min E, min D system that, that many people study. Actually, if you look at it, it has also two conservation laws and they have this, this um, uh, oscillatory dynamics. Okay, all sorts of systems um, emerge as special cases and uh, now if you really wanted to study this, you have, I think, 24 parameters, and uh, it's um, too many, right? Okay, so we had a, a second go, and this is uh, mainly the work of Daniel. And so now uh, we say, okay, we still start with the same ansatz, but now actually we incorporate, um, let's say, the spatial variation on let's say, um, um, short length scale or smaller time scale. So we include sort of two different time scales. I have this term, what looks a bit unusual because now this is an operator. It's not just a prefactor, right? And then this was um, sort of heavy calculations of Daniel. And what we came up with at the end and um, is an amplitude equation that looks at the very first view. If you cross this out and you ignore the bar here, then it looks like a real Ginzburg-Landau equation. However, the cubic term is actually a term that, that uh, contains the mean value of the amplitude square, and there is actually a, a term that is cubic in, in Fourier space, so we just put in the, the back transformations there. So, and then we also get a complex version of this for two different types of the the non reciprocal Carnot equation. Okay, so in some sense, this discussion for now is sort of for us nearly near the end. And what I wanted to say, tell to you with this, that this non reciprocal Carnot equation actually is, has an important role in the, in the hierarchy of, of equations. And I would predict that more studies of this equation will happen the, the, the next years in the context of all the systems. Because now you could go and for each of the systems do a precise weekly nonlinear theory and try to map them onto each other by, by comparing coefficients and so on. Okay, I think I should probably stop about here. So we compared the states that come out of the amplitude equation with the reconstructed dynamics, with the reconstructed bifurcation diagram, and also with the bifurcation diagram for the full theory. And this 
uh, agrees much better than I would have thought, and all the time simulations, but we can talk about this later. Okay, so to keep a little bit time for discussion, um, let's summarize here. So I want to tell you several points. So first, we discussed passive gradient dynamics, and I think that's a very versatile thermodynamically consistent approach to overdamped interface-dominated systems. And um, what I excluded, however, was any vectorial uh, quantities and so on. So this was all for scalar fields, and one can obviously expand this. And then we break this gradient dynamic structure, and I distinguish these three types of non-reciprocity, mechanical, uh, thermodynamic, and, and chemical. Also there, I'm, I'm very much like to discuss uh, this um, let's say, this way of thought stuff. And then I talked at length about the non-reciprocal Hilliard model, showed you what it looks like, what type of structures you can find, and then discussed briefly this spurious gradient dynamic structure that allowed uh, to use a, a Maxwell-type um, uh, approach and discuss phase coexistence. And then I discussed the univers universality of this uh, as an amplitude equation of a higher order and then tried to get a proper amplitude equation. So for the video, I show the references, um, and for the discussion, I leave in the background uh, this movie running. What is the 2D state of coexistence between this uniform background state and this other phase where this interesting dynamics come up? Thank you very much. Two rather simple questions. Uh, can you give sort of a physical perspective on how non-reciprocity quenches coarsening? This round one here. Physical perspective. So, um, in the sense, which fluxes are suppressed by yeah, which terms? Yeah. Not really. I mean, we, we looked more from the mathematical perspective with uh, what instabilities now really to connect. I mean, I could always say it's the fluxes that come from the non-reciprocal term that counteracts the diffusive fluxes, but I mean, it's an empty statement in some sense. Mm -hmm. but, be, because, but I mean, how would I do it? I would sort of take the equation and analyze the, the, the um, the contributions to the dynamics from each of the terms, and then I would come up with exactly such an argument. But mm -hmm. as there is only one non-reciprocal term in each equation, I, I think that's what probably com comes out. Right? Mm -hmm. There are people that um, have simplified the second equation to a linear equation, mm -hmm. and and so then probably you can you can make more, let's say, mm -hmm. I would say, hand waving arguments. What what mm -hmm. are the, the physically uh, the other question is, could you comment on Kahn-Hilliard navier stokes with, uh, with non-reciprocity? What's coming down the pipe there? Yeah, so the, the, the active model H you refer to, that is actually here in, in Cambridge used quite often. Um, I mean, it, it adds, I mean, it couples the, the Kahn-Hilliard equation and navier stokes via Kotovec concentration tensor, and it has an advective term in the Kahn-Hilliard equation. Now, you could add two Kahn-Hilliard equations and then add non-reciprocity. Yeah, but um, I think the, you get inertia. In. I mean, then you can you have to, you can answer the question, what is the influence of inertia, right? I mean, would I the non-reciprocity, in the non-reciprocity, say, drive one Troubles of one out of existence or something at the expense of the other. This kind of thing. But, but then I would probably, before I do go to the to some active non-reciprocal model H, I would actually just go to a let's say put the Kahn-Hilliard on the incline, like the driven Kahn-Hilliard equation, mm -hmm. right? Because there also you have this bubble dynamics that is driven by this let's say this external shear force, you could say. And also there, you could see which type of bubbles gets larger and smaller. And you can still do, let's say, bifurcations. Because for the model H, I'm not aware of anyone having even tried to, to get full bifurcation diagrams for, for the, the, the model H. Not even the passive one. 
I would say. If you can do full surveillance there by sheer numerical power, so by application, but even in the, I think, even the... The model age, for example. Yeah. I can share our papers with you, it's just appeared in print. So, uh, yeah, without going through the bifurcation route. But I think yeah, even... types of turbulence. Yeah, but even for the convective candidate, you get uh, already chaotic states. So you could also, I mean, the, the sure. transition to chaos, you could also look, look, look at there. In your first uh, <coughs> model or the version of the non-reciprocity, you had this quantity alpha, which yeah. is positive or negative. Um, is there any work that actually has derived such a linear or approximately linear model from some other deeper physical principle? Very good question. Um, I am not aware of it. I'm aware of two or three groups that are trying to derive them. And one group is starting from a two-coupled Ising lattices with non-reciprocal coupling. But they have, at the moment, just reached the stage to get homogeneous equations for the case of a non-conserved dynamics. So they are still a bit off, I would say. Um, Julien Tailleur's work goes close to this direction, but um, I think you need then to look specifically into weakly coupled systems, because then a linear coupling would be the obvious choice, because if you go to anything that's not weakly coupled, I mean, then you will get all the, the quartic terms. I mean, that, yeah, as, as in the, what, what I wrote down as a generalized Carnegie equation, there you have all the terms, but then, this various grain dynamics approach will not work anymore. It's out of this class of, of, of models. It works for some nonlinear couplings, but not for very specific ones, let's say. So it's not only for linear systems. So I have one about the final movie. So I can see, I mean, there are many length scales, but there's a length scale which is the domain size, yeah. and there is a length scale which is some kind of interfacial width for these red and blue regions. So I guess my question is, if you keep all the length scales fixed and send the domain size to infinity, does it look the same? Is this meaningfully the, the thermodynamic limit, or are you far from this? I mean, um, you have to. I mean, you have to to say what you do with the mean concentrations when you take your system size to infinity, yes. right? So um, if you adjust the mean concentration in such a way that you have really just that size of the the, let's say the high concentration phase, then you can, I think, take your system size to infinity and you still have the same structure. If you keep the mean concentration fixed, I mean, then your structure will grow as well. Right? You know, I guess I'm thinking about these big bubbles, are they going to stay the same size as I take them? Like no, the bubble dynamic, I mean, the internal bubbles, I mean, that's actually, I didn't comment on them, but um, also in the 1D state, um, let me show this. I, I, did not mention this, but even in the one day sink, when your concentration gets higher, you get actually a reverse, a reverse coarsening, right? So you have there two stripes, that's not what we imposed that really happened. And that is the same as this internal bubbles, and there is one paper by Mike Gates where they, but they had a model, what was it? It was some type of active, uh, with some, but with some funny term that only acted in 2D. And then they got this, uh, what they called reverse Oswald ripening in this internal bubbles. So this would be a system that has it in 1D and 2D, and, uh, but we have no statistics on the holes. And uh, I mean, I have a, maybe I should show you. I have a very, I mean, I like it very much, another movie where we looked at different sides of the central domain to, to, to understand the order, and you will see all of them developed into, into some sort of a stationary state. Um, the, the, one, the second one you will not really see, it is, it's, um, I think it is threefold, threefold symmetry. This one at the top has a nice fourfold symmetry, right, a wave, and then it becomes more or less 
chaotic seemingly. However, this one is the first one where you will see a central hole popping up. And then you get a self-organized wave structure in the self-organized ring, you would say. And the others, they have then some dynamics of holes. So I mean, that would be probably really cool to understand this more in detail. All right. So um, I have one question about the reverse of so in your categorization of three kinds of non-reciprocity, um, there's potentially one more where in the, the conservative sector, you can have a current which is not, uh, not, not just having a non-conservative chemical potential, but it could also have a flux which is not a gradient. Okay, I try not to break the isotropy of the, I mean, you can break isotropy by having External fluxes, for instance? Yeah, no, but, but just building it with higher order gradient terms, which is what Mike and Co. do with their active model B+. Plus. Yeah. And my question was, is there a way in which, uh, because in, at least with the simpli some of the simplified versions of the non-reciprocal Carl Hilliard, you might, might be able to transform some variables to effectively get one of the equations looking like this active model B's kind of things. And maybe that might also help make a connection with the reverse social ripening. Um, I, I would say, I mean, this the classification I proposed is, is a first try, because at the moment, I think people just develop widely yes. many different models, but there is, at the moment, I think, not really a, 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 any clear idea how to sort them and how they are related, which you can transform into which, because everything is yeah. non equilibrium non... Yeah, on whatever. Yes. So yeah, I, 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 and I didn't put the disclaimer, but I mean this classification that I propose is neither complete nor probably, uh, yeah. So sure. it's just uh, just to get this discussion a bit going, I think. Uh, and, and another quick question was in the final version of the universal eighth amplitude equation that you yeah. showed. Do you have? Uh, can you give me maybe comment on? some intuition for why and how that structure is, non, the non-locality of that structure, because you have the mean concentration entering and then the inverse Fourier transform? I mean, the structure is sort of interesting because, I mean, first it has overall, it's again a fourth order equation, right? So it has somehow the structure of a Carnot equation again, but it has fewer parameters, so this is the real, the real one that's actually, this has a gradient dynamic structure. You can give an energy for this one and you can, so, so in, in um, the, the amplitude space, let's say it's a gradient dynamics, but in the real space then transformed back, it's all traveling waves. And you can give all of them analytically. Um, now this comes from summing up different, different wave number contributions essentially, and then you need to back transform. Um, so, so the idea was that by having that operator sit in front of the amplitude, you're not just focusing on one uh, dominant mode, but the whole spectrum. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I, I, as I said, I mean, this, um, this is discussed also by Furch and Zimmermann, but only published in the PhD thesis of him, but they, they did not get to this equation because they truncated at some point. So they truncated and then got a, a lengthy equation. Um, and um, what else did I want to say? Um, yeah, I mean, this is sort of still quite a bit in discussion, I would say. Right. Any questions? Thank you very much, Ray.